This is the Puck Poolies Podcast with Matt Larkin and Stephen Ellis. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Puck Poolies Podcast. It's Matt Larkin here with Stephen Ellis. We've been away for a few weeks. Stephen was off in Switzerland having the time of his life with the chocolate and clocks. And here I am just stereotyping Switzerland right off, right off the hop here. Uh, but we're excited. It's a special episode today. Yes. <laughs> it's a special episode. That was Stephen showing. I, were you holding up chocolate bars, by the way? Yeah. So these chocolate oh, bars are like 50 cents, but these are like some of the most popular chocolate bars I have. Amazing. So yeah, if anyone's listening, not watching, Stephen was just holding up some chocolate bars. So this is a special episode of Puck Poolies. We are talking specifically about keeper leagues because we know it's the time of year where you're between seasons in your fantasy leagues. And if you're in a keeper league, you often have to make these tough decisions. And a lot of leagues have various keeper declaration deadlines. I know mine's coming up pretty soon. So we want to help you with those decisions. We're going to talk prospects and keepers today. And before we get into it, though, Stephen, if we're looking at the Stanley Cup playoffs, how's your bracket doing? Well, uh, like everyone, Boston screwed things up, <laughs> um, and I did not pick Toronto to move on, just kind of out of you know the history of everything there. So uh, I think I still got three teams left, so it kind of got decimated in that first one. Uh, I kind of big-brained it there on the Islanders and, and Carolina Hurricanes one, and um, so not, not going super well, but I did pick Edmonton to go to the final, so I still got that going for me. Um, I also will update, because the last episode we did was right in the middle of the championship for my pool. And uh, I won. So I won the the, the, the four team pool. And then I, I came second last in my bigger one where I was trying to, to lose on purpose to get a good pick. You know, Connor Bedard's looking pretty good right now. Um, but um, on, on for that, we the, my, the guy I was facing in the final with McDavid and um, uh, Matthews, he actually did the one day he did the auto like pick who was in the lineup. And for whatever reason, it didn't put McDavid in the lineup. And he had like a four point night or something. Uh, so that didn't go so well. It was the one where he broke or he, he, he went, uh, over like 60 goals and things like that. And it was, I was like, Whoa, what happened here? So, uh, yeah, that really worked out in my favor. Yeah. <laughs> my, it's been, yeah, it's been a rough few weeks for me. My bracket is an absolute nightmare. I got two series right in the first round and I didn't feel like I was going out on a limb, you know, things like, Hey, the Leafs have to prove it. I'm not picking to win a series anymore. Stuff like that happened. I thought the jets were going to upset Vegas because of Connor Hellebuck. And yeah, I got absolutely annihilated two and six. And in fantasy, my main league, I'm now staring down a long rebuild. I was a major contender three years in a row. I made it to the conference final, lost three times in a row in the conference final. And now I have no first round pick next year. My all my youth movement is gone. I think it, like my keepers are going to be like Carter Verhage and like Jacob Truba. And at least I thought, okay, at least I have a, go- a good goalie to build around in Vitek Vanacek. But now Akira Schmidt has stolen his job. And because you can only keep two goalies per team. I had Mackenzie Blackwood rostered when the season ended, which means I wasn't allowed to pick up a Kira Schmidt, which means now oh. I can't keep him. So I think I've lost my goalie keeper the way things have gone in these playoffs, but we'll see. So, Stephen, uh, I think we're ready to start going through the keeper game. So let's let's get to it. We have a lot of different categories to go through, and how do you want to start here? All right, we're going to start here with the Keeper League Risers NHL Edition. Basically, which NHL players have made the biggest jumps in long-term fantasy value this season? And it's something that we've we've discussed a few times on this show. For sure. So what I was looking at f- for the criteria for this question was specifically not just someone who had a great year. And, okay, Jason Robinson. Jason Robinson, good. Well, he was good last year. He was already close to an elite commodity. I'm, I'm looking at who made a big leap into a different stratosphere. So first name I have for you is Tim Stutzla of the Ottawa Senators. It's crazy just how much he's leaving the 2020 draft class in his dust. It's not even close at this point. If you look at Lafreniere and Byfield, it's just Stutzla by a mile. 90 points this year in 78 games, I think it was, 78, 79 games. 228 shots, 114 hits. He's only 21 years old. So to me, he's already now, I think, a top 25 asset in fantasy at worst. I think you can make a case he could be top 15 by next season as well when you're drafting. So maybe end of the first round, beginning of the second round. I don't think it's crazy to consider Stutzla at this point. Going into the season, I think he was perceived to be maybe a top 60 commodity. So that's a big jump in fantasy value, similar to what we saw with Jack Hughes this year. So to me, that's a big a big change in value. Tage Thompson, of course, is the really obvious one. After last season, he was a major breakout, but 
I don't think anyone expected the breakout on top of the breakout where he destroyed his career highs again, 47 goals, 94 points, and maybe the most unique talent in the National Hockey League just with his size, his skill, what he brings to the table in that gigantic frame. It's important to note that he is, I think, 26 in October, so he might be close to his peak, but the peak is still pretty spectacular. He gets so many shots. So if I'm drafting a redraft league in fantasy right now, I think Tate Thompson's probably a first-round pick now. I think he may be top 10, top 12, but I wouldn't hesitate taking him late in the first round. So that's another big change. And the other guy, you know, it's funny. I was making my list yesterday and after after the Oilers lose game one and give up a lot of goals. It doesn't look great to talk about Stuart Skinner, but hey, he's also a Calder Trophy finalist. To me, that's another player who's completely off the radar going into the season expected to just be a backup to jack campbell he steals the job he he appears in almost 50 games as a rookie and the oilers just they're still equipped to be a competitive team for years to come so now all of a sudden Stuart skinner i think could be a top 10 top 12 goaltender going forward so to me again that's a major change in fantasy value all right, next up is the Keeper League Riser NHL Affiliated Prospects. Basically, which NHL affiliated players have made the biggest jumps in long-term fantasy value this season? And you've got some interesting ones here. Yeah, so NHL affiliated for the uninitiated means they're drafted they're, or, or signed, whatever. They're the property of an NHL team already, but they haven't really broken through. One of the guys here actually technically has a couple NHL games to his name, but he's not really an NHL or proper yet. So first name, Dustin Wolf of the Calgary Flames has been... I don't know if you could say the most dominant goaltender in the history of the AHL. He did win the MVP this year. He's been absolutely unbelievable, just trying to bang, crash, explode the door to get onto the Calgary Flames roster. We know they do have a logjam right now, but Daryl Sutter's out. I think there's going to be much more openness to having Calgary Wranglers play on the team next year at the NHL level, not just the AHL level. And I suspect the Flames will find a way to trade Dan Vladar. Vladar? Vladar? Vlader, Vladar, Dan Vladar. They're not going to trade Jacob Markstrom. I, don't, I think it's still too early. The buyout would still be relatively expensive. you got to give him another shot, especially with a new coaching staff coming in. But I think they can make room for Wolf by trading Vladar, and Wolf will get his shot. And you could see a Stuart Skinner situation where he comes in as the backup or 1B, and by the end of next season, he's actually the starter. So that's one for you, Stephen. Um, next one for you, Logan Stankoven, the Dallas Stars. The Stars are really amazing to me in the sense that a couple years ago, it looked like they were kind of done, right? The 2020 Cup Final, they're an old team, and it seemed like it was their last gasp, but now they've completely reloaded, restocked that farm system, have some very exciting players coming up. Logan Stankoven, just a big-time scorer and junior, and I think, especially with the way we're seeing Tyler Sagan deployed on the wing in these playoffs, it opens up the idea that your number two and three centers could be Wyatt Johnson and Logan Stankoven as early as next season. So big upside there. Last one for you, Brant Clark, Los Angeles Kings. Went absolutely bananas with Barry this year. Two points a game almost. And I think the Kings will trade out a right shot defenseman, try and make room to get him in their lineup next year. And I think he could be a legitimate Calder Trophy candidate, maybe 40-point threat as a rookie next year. Yeah, so I had a bit more context as to some of these guys. So for Dustin Wolf, he has now won in the two leagues he's played in the WHL and AHL. He's won top goalie uh, the last four years. And uh, before... The first, the, his first year in the WHL, he actually had the best stats. So for five years, he's dominated. So it's not like it's, you know, it's a small goalie. And one of our guests here coming up, Ryan Kennedy, uh, I, I talked about him during the draft where I'm like, Dustin Wolf is going to go in like the seventh round and it's going to be a total mistake. He's way too good. And I have kept going over. I was at the, I wasn't at the draft that year. I was with my dad and I'm like, People, teams are just passing over this guy who's going to be an NHL starter in a few years. And it, it was it's happened a little quicker than I thought. But uh, Dustin Wolf, I, I think, will be the starting goal next year. And with Brant Clark, if you look at him, when he was part of the Domino's Flyers, this like superstar U16 team a couple of years ago, uh, he was he had over 100-something points passing to Shane Wright and Brandon Ottman. And that team was just downright dominant. I think they lost like three games all year long. It was something like just utterly ridiculous how good that team was and they played in the ohl cup final against adam fantilli it was like the it was a star study game but clark was the driving force of that team so um i do expect him to have a good career it, the, it's funny though um kind of like lane hudson uh the thing about brant clark is the biggest deficiency in his game is his defensive play which as a defenseman is not always ideal but uh as a guy who could run the power play who could put points on the board we know what he could do
For sure. And Lane Hudson, that's another good example of someone whose keeper league value took a a big leap this year as an NHL affiliated prospect. So keeping the risers theme going, Stephen, I want to pass the buck to you now and talk specifically about 2023 draft prospects. That's your area of expertise, not mine. So who has risen, do you think, in terms of fantasy value in the draft class lately? Well, the one guy that uh, I I was not very high on at the beginning of the season, and I'm still not super high on him, but I'm not going to ignore kind of how good uh, he was with um, uh, offensively this year, which is Jaden Perron um, from the Chicago Steel, who he plays on the same team as Macklin Celebrini, one of the top prospects for 2024. Um, But he went out there this year. He put up 72 points, 24 goals, 48 assists. Uh, Last year, he only had 45 points. That was a huge increase. Um, He's a University of North Dakota commit. And with him, it was, you know, he's a small player but he was a great passer and it was kind of like, can he put the board points on the board in the first half of that season? He was playing at a point per game rate, which is nothing overly special in the USHL, but uh, he eventually kind of figured it all out and put up some great numbers. So uh, I think he's someone that, you know, if teams could overlook the fact that he's five, eight, I think, you know, he's got the skill to be a very effective offensive forward in, in the NHL. Um, then there's Gabe Perot and the guy that I recently wrote about for dailyfaceoff.com about how he just obliterated, Austin Matthews U.S. National Development Team points record by like I think almost twenty points at this point, um, just absolute star of a prospect. Um, but you know he's not a great skater, and defensively he's not fantastic either. So the thing here is he's a finisher, but he's also a very smart player. He knows where he's got to be, and that really works out very well. And a guy that thinks the game like he does is going to have an NHL career. So I expect him to be better than his brother, Jacob Perot. Uh, and then, of course, their dad is Yannick Perot. Um, but when it comes to to Gabriel Perot, I think, you know, you got to give him the right line mates to make it all work. And it will be interesting to see if there's somehow the way the draft lays out that maybe he gets on the same team as Will Smith. We don't know because those guys are great together um, in, in the U.S. National Development Program. And then the third guy I want to talk about is Matthew Wood, who was on Canada's top line for the U18s. And... He's a guy that was playing in, in junior A hockey. Um, so he put up a lot of points, but it was like, could he do that in the NCAA? And he fast tracked so he could play a year early in the NCAA. And so far, so good. He played at a point per game pace at the University of Connecticut. Uh, he was one of Canada's best players at the U18s. I will have a story on him heading into the draft, a very interesting prospect. Um, and he's got big size. So at six foot three, he could skate, he could hit, he could score. Those are the type of guys that teams look for. So I think those are three guys that should make some noise uh, in the NHL. So it's an exciting draft. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So now we're going to we're gonna put on our pessimist hat, Stephen, and we're going to talk about some fallers, keeper league fallers. We're going to do the same type of tiered themes. We're going to start with established NHL players who I think have taken a nosedive in their keeper value. So the first one, this one saddens me because he's so damn good. It's UC Saros of the Nashville Predators. We saw what the Preds started doing as the season progressed. As we got to the trade deadline, they're taking the whole thing apart. And, of course, Matias Heckholm gets traded. Mikhail Granlin, the list goes on, right? And we know, of course, David Poyle's out. He's loaded up. Barry Trotz with draft picks. This team, and also David Poyle implied, uh, it was actually talking to our own Frank Cervalli, that there was at least another name he was trying to trade as well. So the implication there is the Preds are tearing it down, and that means everything around Soros is going to crumble. So wins are going to be harder to come by. He's still an elite goaltender, but I think maybe the quality of chances against him will go up as well. So I think his arrow, unfortunately, in fantasy is pointing down. He doesn't deserve it, but it's just it's the case right now. Second name for you, Matthew Barzell, who for his entire career really has been an overrated fantasy commodity, had that great rookie season, called the trophy 85 points. Since then, career high 82 goals, 67 points per 82 games. And I think there was a perception among some that, hey, Barry Trotz is out as coach. Lane Lambert's going to change things. But Lane Lambert was a disciple of Barry Trotz. So the Islanders played pretty much the same brand of hockey. And there's no doubting Matt Barzell's raw talent, but he's just not a guy who is an elite player in fantasy. I think we have to accept now that he's a tier two or even tier three player. And I think this year sort of cemented that. So arrow down for Matt Barzell. And the last one, again, this is really saddens me because he's a great player, exciting player, Andre Svechnikov, Carolina Hurricanes. First, we have to talk about the injury, of course, torn ACL. It's going to take a long time to recover from that. Based on his timeline, it happened in March. Best case scenario is ready around training camp, start of the season, but more likely it'll be closer to the beginning of the winter. So 
immediately that's a reason for his keeper value to go down. But also, even before that, he's just a player who I kept waiting for him to have that monster season where he gets 90 points and 250 hits and becomes a first-round pick. just hasn't happened. And I, I can't think that the ACL tear is good news for his long-term development as well. Hard injury to come back from. So arrow down for Andre Sechnikov. All right. Um, when it comes to, Sar- to UC Saros, we also need to keep in mind that, you know, Askarov is coming and it's going to be hard to keep him down the way he played in the NHL next year. It was good that they signed Kevin Lankin in, but it was in- it was kind of weird that they signed Kevin Lankin in. That gives them a bit of extra time where they can hold on to Askarov and they don't need him to be rushed up right away. But I think Askarov's ready. So I think he'll start the year in the AHL, but I think he'll be something where he's pushing for starts uh, by the end of the season. And you never know. He's kind of th- that's a situation where you got one of the best goalies in the league, and you might not even need him because you've got another young goalie that's coming through. That's a good situation to be in. Uh, our next section will be on uh, NHL affiliated prospects. So we kind of know what that is, but which uh, which of these players have taken the biggest falls? Yeah. So again, some of these guys have I, actually all three of them have technically gotten some NHL action, but they're not again established NHLers. So I'm still considering them affiliated prospects. The first one, Nick Robertson of the Toronto Maple Leafs. So when healthy, he's had trouble sticking in the lineup full time. Of course, he's had flashes. He's got a great shot. He was a big time goal scorer in Major Junior and also flash playing in the AHL. But there's always been concerns about his commitment to defense. And when you're that type of player, it's hard to stay in the lineup. Because if you're not in the top six, then typically the coach doesn't want you in the lineup if you're going to be a liability defensively. So we saw Nick Robertson in the press box quite a lot. And then, of course, season-ending shoulder injury. He's had several major injuries. He's a broken leg, right? He had a knee. So it just seems like he doesn't have the ability to stay healthy. And it seems like the Leafs missed an opportunity to sell high on him. So I think the value has gone way down for Nick Robertson. Other one is Alex, Alex Turcott of the Los Angeles Kings, part of a very deep farm system there. He was perceived to be an exciting player, a center, really smart player, maybe like a, I don't know, maybe a Robert Thomas type in terms of his intelligence, two-way intelligence, but injuries have really derailed his timelines, had a couple of concussions, had a lower body injury, and even at the AHL level, he hasn't shown the kind of dominance I think you want to see just to sort of force the issue to the NHL level, so... I think the arrow is down for Alex Turcott. Last one, Bobby Brink of the Philadelphia Flyers. He got the cup of coffee coming out of university, right? Last year, and I thought he was going to be an NHL fixture. Ended up needing hip surgery. Started the season late in the AHL. Never got back to the NHL this year. So I think the progression has slowed for him as well. So those are my three fallers. Do you know Bobby Brink's middle name? No, what is it? It's, it's Orr. Bobby Orbrink. Oh my God. Yeah. I remember the first time I heard that, that was absolutely nuts. And his, his he kind of explained it as like his, his family just really liked Bobby Orr. Uh, with Nick Robertson, a guy that I loved watching him play in junior, but it kind of felt like I remember writing a note saying like built like soggy paper. And this is the <laughs> guy just gets hurt so often. And it's so bad to see because it's like it's he's having to rehab so often. Um, but you know, he's a good kid. He's a lot of talent. I still think he could have an initial future, but he's also something where if he wasn't a Toronto Maple Leaf, I don't think we hear about him much at all. Um, I think it was just part of the team that drafted him that made that such a big deal. Yeah, I think that that's bang on. And, and the weird thing too, with Nick Robertson is his, his brother is so big. Like Jason Robertson yeah. is big and strong. I don't really get how the genetics are so different between the two brothers there. It seems like he got the short, literally the short end of the stick. Uh, so now, Stephen, let's talk 2023 draft prospects again. Who are the fallers in terms of fantasy value? All right. So we'll start off with uh, Alex Schernick, and he plays in Sweden. Uh, he's a Slovakian prospect, and one that really kind of came to prominence for his play with uh, Dalibor Dvorsky. Um, but I think it became kind of clear at points that he was more of a passenger, and he was he was setting up Dvorsky, but he was like letting Dvorsky do all the work with Slovakia's national team, but um, a guy with a lot of skill, good speed, I think there's a good base there, but some talking to some scouts, they're just concerned that his work ethic is not there, and when you got a guy who's skilled that isn't always trying, it's not a good mix. Um, so someone where like people were comparing him to kind of like Alex Radulov, and I could kind of see that, where it's like the, the skill's there, can he put it together every single night? I'm not sure, um, but I still think, you know, he's a guy who could go second, third round and be a good value player. Um, but we're talking about a guy who was were, really was a first round quality prospect at one point that has just kind of fallen down the ranks. Um, another one is Charlie Stramel. And 
if you're a team or uh, if you like collect penalty minutes in your league, you're going to love him uh, hits same thing. But for a guy that's about as big as he is, I think he's like six, four, but he's just built like a tank. He's strong. He's hard to move out of the way. Uh, he had a very poor NCAA freshman season offensively. And I think some people are concerned that this is someone who is not going to be a huge contributor at the NHL level. And it was like maybe a top 15 pick early in the year. Now it's like second round, maybe um, for a team like he's kind of looking like a guy that could have been a second liner now more look like being like a fourth liner that can play this physical game. So there are some stats there that will be kind of helpful in fantasy, but to the point that we expected a lot more and we just didn't get to see that this year. And the other one being Cameron Allen. And I think almost everyone was expecting him to be a point per game defenseman this year in the OHL, the way he started his career with the Guelph storm. Uh, he was someone that, um, it was an early prospect in the OHL draft, so he had a lot of hype around him. Um, but it just kind of hasn't didn't fall that way this year. So he had 37 points last year, which if we look at how progressions typically work for junior defensemen, we were looking at 50, 60 points this year. He actually fell down to 25, took more penalty minutes, was on the ice for a lot more goals against. And then we saw him at the U18s, and he was a giveaway machine. So it mm. looks like something happened there where he went from this guy that was very highly rated, like maybe the best defenseman in this draft to is he even a first round prospect at this point? And this will happen from time to time. You'll get these guys that are highly rated at an early age that just fall off. And it's, I think there's still a good, you know, he's, he could be a low risk, high reward type guy because he has fallen so much. Um, but if you get him in the second round, like he might be a valuable guy, but the confidence just doesn't look there. The decision making doesn't look to be there. And that kind of in turn um, resulted in a pretty poor season for him. Hmm. Okay, so that's it for the risers and followers. What's next, my friend? All right, today is the tip of the week, and this one I like a lot. Don't overlook prior draft classes and obsess over the latest. Yeah, this is a weird one because it sounds so simple, but I really think it's a trap that people fall into all the time. I just see it, when, especially in a redraft league. You're excited about the most recent draft class. There's a recency bias there, and you're reaching for that type of player when you're overlooking someone from a previous draft class who's a more mature player, has had another year of seasoning. So a good example would be someone who reached in the draft this year for your Slavkovsky. Hey, he's the first overall pick. He's going to make the team. Go Habs go. All the hype. When someone like, let's say, a Matty Veneers was sitting there who had already gotten a little bit of seasoning, the previous year and then he ends up waltzing to the Calder Trophy and I think you do see it all the time so this year I think it's really important to remember this because there's going to be so much hype around this draft class right Connor Bedard of course he's probably going to be a, a picked in the first couple rounds but if you look at someone let's say like an Adam Fantilli there's going to be a lot of hype and I think people are going to want to grab him very early in drafts or relatively early in drafts as well but you can't overlook someone like a luke hughes or a logan cooley who's had more seasoning and might actually be better set up to make an impact next year just based on the fact that there's that extra year so i think that people just you can't take your eye off those previous draft classes make sure you look at every team system find some players who are very clearly ready for the nhl maybe got a cup of coffee late in this season that's what you have to look for Another name to watch out for is Simon Nemec, a guy that I feel like no one's talking about. He was a second overall pick last year, and I think that was kind of a, a thing, a circumstance. I'm not sure he was the second best prospect, but um, I think the fact is that like he's been overlooked heavily, and part of that is, I think, because of Luke Hughes' arrival, but we'll see what he could do next year. So I, I think that's uh, kind of a, an interesting one. For sure. Well, let's talk a little bit more prospects. I mean, we're talking prospects for this entire episode, but in terms of our regular traditional update segment, Stephen, you just did come back from the under-18 World Championships. So can you just give me a breakdown of a particular prospect maybe who showed an exciting long-term ceiling from a fantasy perspective at the tournament? Well, it was nice to see Dalibor Dvorsky play his best hockey of his career. And when he kind of showed up on the scene a couple of years ago with that Helenka Gretzky, it was like, this guy's going to be a superstar in the NHL. The way he was dominant, like he played on the same team as Slavkovsky. It made Slavkovsky, who was older, look pedestrian in comparison. Like Dvorsky had one of the best Helenka Gretzky's we've ever seen and was a big reason why Slovakia advanced to the final against Russia. No one saw that one coming. Um, but to, it, it felt like we've seen Dvorsky play internationally for like a decade at this point, but it's because he played so young at the U18 level um, that he's been able to kind of stick around and be a key contributor at the U20 level too. You know, 
I think there's still a lot of games where you look at him and say, like, man, you got to see the work ethic here. It just it's not always there. Um, but from a pure skill standpoint, he was my pick to be the MVP in the um, in the under 18s because Slovakia was not playing for a medal if it wasn't for the way he played in this tournament. He had four points against Germany in the game that sent Slovakia to the quarterfinal. And then was a big reason why they went up there and beat the Finns and just kind of he was scoring in all these games. He was just as uh, just rock solid. And I think a lot of people were looking at him and saying he could maybe go in the top 10. I'm still not convinced, but I think, you know, part of the issue here is we didn't see a lot of great stuff with him playing against men in Sweden. And that's always tough. But against his own age group, he was fantastic. So we'll, we'll continue to see how that development goes. Um, but I do think, you know, as he continues to get stronger, smarter and everything, I think he's going to be someone that's going to be a very valuable prospect and, and definitely one that is going to rise a few spots because of that tournament. Okay, good name to know for fantasy circles. Uh, Steven, now it's time for our ProLine Plus best bet of the week. And this is one of those times where I want to thank ProLine for some generous odds. And I don't understand. I'm looking at the Stanley Cup futures of the eight remaining teams. And the team that I picked to win the Stanley Cup has the seventh best odds out of eight. What? The Dallas Stars plus 850 to win the cup right now. The stranger thing is the team with the eighth best odds is the Seattle Kraken, which to me is a weird contradiction. If they're playing against the team perceived to be the biggest underdog, why would they have the second worst odds to win the Stanley Cup? They should be much higher. I think the plus 850 is absolute robbery. And I've said this before, the big reason why I picked Dallas to win the cup, they have the three pillar system that you usually see in a Stanley Cup champion. You have the rock and net. Jake Gottinger is easily the best goaltender left in the Stanley Cup playoffs. You have the superstar forward, Jason Robertson. You have the superstar defenseman, maybe the best defenseman left in the tournament right now, Miro Heiskanen. If you look at the way the Colorado Avalanche, Tampa Bay Lightning were built, they had the same thing. They had the superstar goalie. They had, or at least a really strong goaltender. They had a superstar forward, superstar defenseman as well. So I love the way the Stars are constructed. Yes, they're down one nothing in the series. They were down one nothing in the first round as well. No big deal. I think it's great value to pick the Dallas Stars to win the Stanley Cup. What do you think of that one? I love that one. I'm again. I'm shocked that they're that those far off odds because you know it's a team that doing their preview. Uh, it's like you know they don't really have a ton of flaws. You know they've got when, when they're a healthy group and now that they got Pavelski, they can score. They can be a very strong defensive team, and they've got one of the best goalies in the in the ter- uh, the playoffs. At the same time, you know it's not going to be easy against Seattle, a team that's been grinding out wins and actually had one of the best goalies in that first round, which I don't think anyone saw happening with Phil Grubauer. But um, at those odds, I think it's a no-brainer. All righty. And a word from our sponsor, ProLine Plus. ProLine Plus is not just another sports book, being the only sports book that gives 100% of the profits back to Ontario. ProLine has been your local trusted sports book for over 30 years, now offering Ontario sports fans more ways to play in-store, online, or take the game on the go with the ProLine app. With your favorite sports and events right at your fingertips, download the ProLine app and bet in-app with ProLine Plus today or head over to ProLinePlus.ca to learn more. And next up, Stephen, I'm very excited for our guest. It's a blast from the past. If you're people who have followed Stephen and my work dating back to our hockey news days, Ryan Kennedy is up next. Next up, we have maybe the most special guest in the history of Puck Poolies, and that is includes a guest list that you know we had we had michael buble we had daniel degrani but this is different guys this is our former podcast co-host our former co-worker at the hockey news now the editor-in-chief of the hockey news also the king of the prospect ryan kennedy it's good to see your face my friend how are you doing i'm doing great thank you for that wonderful intro yeah, it was pretty pretty elaborate and epic, but I figured you know it, it was just it was necessary, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of people excited to hear our voices in the same virtual room again. So, Ryan, the reason why we have you on, of course, this is sort of a prospect episode because we're talking keepers, and we figure who better to bring on than the man who knows so much about prospects. So, you want to start with just a general question about fantasy sports. I know you're not a diehard player, but you've played from time to time. And if you're thinking about qualities that prospects have that appeal to fantasy players in a keeper league mm-hmm. context, do you think it's more important to search for someone that has pure talent that's going to win out, or is it more about a player's path to immediate playing time? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're looking at keeper, then you got to be a little bit patient. And I, I would look for prospects that have specific skills that, that make them stand out. Because one thing I've noticed is, 
you know, prospects that are kind of good at everything, they can become very good NHLers. Um, they might not put up spectacular numbers. And then, you know, obviously if you're, if you're doing pool, uh, you want the guys that are putting up the numbers. So for me, I would look at, you know, those elite skills, whether it's puck handling, uh, goal scoring, or, you know, straight up skating. I think that's a big one these days because, you know, we're seeing players drafted just on their skating. And obviously you don't want to rely on that, uh, if you're doing fantasy, but you know, if you have a kid that has those wheels, if you lock in on him early, then you're going to see the dividends eventually. So, you know, path, we've seen a couple instances, you know, you look at the New York Rangers right now, where maybe with Alexi Lafreniere and Capo Caco, you say, okay, well, they had been on a team that didn't have top six forwards already. Maybe we would have seen them getting 60, 70 points, uh, you know, like a Maddie Beniers in Seattle, for example. But who knows? I mean, maybe that's just what they are right now. So, Ryan, who's an NHL affiliated prospect that no one is talking about that you think can make a good long term impact? I look at a player like Pavla Minchikov, uh, the defenseman drafted by the Anaheim Ducks in the first round. You know, this is a player that has always put up pretty good numbers in junior, but, um, you know, moving over from Saginaw to Ottawa, he just kept it going. And, you know, this is a player that when he was with Saginaw kind of had to do everything. Um, so he kind of rounded out his game, whether he wanted to or not, but he has that amazing offensive component. And you look at the Anaheim Ducks, they've certainly got options for the future. You know, Jamie Drysdale obviously missed most of this year with injury, but he's going to be a good one. You got Olin Zellweger coming up, who is a spectacular offensive defenseman. But in terms of players that I, I don't think are getting enough due right now, Minchikov would be one for me. Yeah, that's a good answer, especially just factoring in that we're a few days away from the Connor Bedard lottery. So if you have Mintikov out there, what, or, or maybe Zellweger when the time comes, but on a power play that might have Connor Bedard out there, it's pretty mm -hmm. exciting. Uh, Ryan, I wanted to give you a, a special request here. So I want you to look. The rules are prospects that have not played an NHL game yet. Who mm -hmm. would be your favorite dynasty league pick? One goalie, one defenseman, one forward. Okay, so I'll start with uh, goaltender. Uh, I'll go with Jesper Wallstead, uh, the Minnesota Wild prospect, uh, has been with Iowa in the AHL this season. You know, <clears throat> just seeing him at the World Juniors, uh, seeing him adapt to North American play, he has all the elements. And, you know, we've seen him be a rock for teams in the past, and I don't expect that to change. And, you know, you look at the, the Minnesota Wild, you know, how long is Marc-Andre Fleury going to go, or, you know, going to be around philip gustafson obviously had a, a tremendous season um but you like to have options and wallstead obviously just beginning his career he's you know just 20 right now um so he would be he would be mine where i feel like good situation you know good pedigree good results uh so i would go with him um for forwards i'm gonna say logan cooley uh with arizona uh I want. I, I was also. I was like, is that too obvious? Should I say Cutter Gautier uh, or Jimmy Snuggerud? But Logan Cooley is just like he just gets it done, you know. And um, you know he has all those great high end elements. Um, obviously, he can produce. Obviously, he can skate. Getting good development in the University of Minnesota. It'll be interesting to see how long he is a Gopher and, and when he goes to Arizona. But you know they need high end talent. They need centers, and that's what he is. So uh, I'll go with him. And then for defense, uh, I already mentioned Minchikov, so I'll go next down the line. I'll say Kevin Korczynski. Uh, Chicago Blackhawks draft pick, so you know there's going to be roster spots available in the next couple of years, and he is still developing uh, in the WHL, but tremendous offensive defenseman. And you know I think we're going to see a lot more of him in the next sort of calendar year. And that could open up a lot of eyes, I would say. So you look at the last couple of years, we got guys like Kale McCarr, Adam Fox, Samir Heiskin, and these guys that are these big fantasy producers uh, on the blue line. But we are going to have a few more coming through. Guys like Luke Hughes, David Yerchek, Brant Clark, Simon Nemich, and Simon Edvidson. Uh, I guess ranking those guys, who do you think's got the highest ceiling for fantasy hockey? Yeah, so for me, Luke Hughes would be number one. 
um, just in the little bit that he played for the Devils at the end of the year, you could see like he's fearless out there. And again, you know, going back to um, the beginning of this interview, you know, talking about special skills like skating. Since the first time I saw Luke Hughes, I think he was 15. The skating has been incredible. And the way he gets around the ice, it's just so, um, you know, in vogue, I guess you would say. Uh, in the NHL, and and he has the skills to back it up. So Hughes would be number one. I would say Brant Clark would be number two for me. Um, you know, again because he has that great offensive mind. And going to a Los Angeles team that is interesting because it's sort of a bit of a mix of the old and the new. Uh, you know, he got a little bit of experience earlier in the year, so I think that'll help him uh, quite a bit. And then you know from there, I would say David Juracek because he's got the big point shot. Uh, and again, Columbus, they need talent. Um, it's funny because Simone Nemich, who I'll put after your check, was seen as more of an all around guy that could probably, you know, play on your power play. But because he's got Luke Hughes ahead of him in New Jersey, I would I would put him below your check. And then Simon Edmondson in Detroit, uh, love him as a defenseman. I just think he will be more of an all around guy. Um than that sort of pure offensive blue liner. So I'll stick him last, but but not in my heart. I'm a big Simon <laughs> Edmondson fan. He regardless. And we wish him a, a, a happy recovery. Or not happy recovery, but a, a speedy recovery is the word I'm looking Indeed. for. Obviously he's out for, I think it's six to nine months, if I remember correctly, the timeline. Uh, like yeah. So, Ryan, I wanted to ask you quickly about the 2023 draft class. Of course, it's the Connor Bedard year. The hype is off the charts. I think... It wouldn't be a big stretch in fantasy to be taking Connor Bedard in the second round next year. But who do you think behind Bedard has the best fantasy potential? Obviously, we have Adam Fantilli, but also you have Matt Bay Mitchkov. If someone's willing to wait in their keeper league until he's done his KHL contract, Leo Carlson, the list goes on and on. So, who is the number two player in terms of fantasy hockey potential in that draft class? I'm going to say Fantilli. I think he's number two in the draft rankings, but I, I would put him number two in fantasy as well. I think Leo Carlson's going to be a fantastic NHLer. Uh, I see some Andre Kopitar in him. Um, and Andre Kopitar, you know, he's put up some good points, but he's more known as that sort of selkie guy. Um, and, and with Mitch Goff, you're right. You're, you're going to have to wait for him. And he doesn't have, a, doesn't have much size either. I'm, I'm sure he'll be very good. But, you know, with Fantilli... Who knows? I mean, hypothetically, he could start making an impact next year in the NHL. We don't know yet if he's going to return to the University of Michigan or, you know, it, it, it all depends on which team selects him and, and what they think is the best path. So I think with his size and his skill and his skating, uh, to me, that's kind of a no brainer. OK, I, I dig it. And uh, Ryan, before we let you go, we're going to bring you in for our listener questions this week because they're both keeper related, prospect related. So, Stephen, you have the floor and let's fire some questions off. Ryan, you can answer first. Then, Stephen, I'll go third. Sure. All right. Uh, Hockey Editor 2 asks Who is a player outside of the first round this year that could be a valuable pickup in a keeper draft? Okay. So, I'm going, I'm going off. I don't know if I can go off the board when it's an open ended question, but I'm going to go with Jason Shogaby. Uh, the winger with War Road High School in Minnesota. He broke TJ Oshie's school scoring record this year, so that's pretty impressive. But, you know, just watching this kid all year, dazzling playmaker, like incredible vision, um, you know, long-term prospect. You know, he's going to have to go through USHL and the college ranks after that before he – and he might even need some AHL time as well, but – I mean, if we're talking keeper, I think, you know, Shagaby has incredible potential. Yeah, see, that's one where I'm looking at this. And I'm thinking Bradley Nadu, uh, a guy yep. that, uh, you know, probably if he, if he wasn't playing in Penticton, probably would be getting a lot more attention. But, you know, watching him play, the kind of the name that I've heard scouts say is Victor Olofsson. And we know Olofsson, when he's good, he could put up a lot of goals. But, um, you know, with, with Nadu, it's kind of got, he's got that individual skill, got good speed. Uh, he's always on the attack. So that's kind of someone that I'm, I'd be looking at. But what are you, what are your thoughts on him? Yeah, I think, you know, Penticton has always been a, a very good sort of cradle for prospects. You know, one of the elite teams in all of Junior A, not just the BCHL. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I think he's one of those 25 to 40 guys where if he went late in the first round, I'd be like, okay, I get it. 
but if he did fall into the second round, then I would understand that as well, because again, a bit of a longer path, but certainly a very exciting prospect. I'm going to cheat for my answer because, hey, what position can yield a elite player best in his class at that position? And you don't have to necessarily take him the first round. It's goaltender, right? So, Stephen, you wrote about Michael Harabel. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. I've never said it aloud before. From Chechia as the guy with the best ceiling in the draft class in net. So that is my pick. I feel like it's a bit slimy for me to do that, but I don't care. No, that's fair. He's he's a guy of good stuff. Guy of good size, you know. Good, uh, you know. The the one thing I think, you know, he was very hard on himself when he lost that game against the Americans uh, in the in the in the quarterfinals of the U18s. But you know, in a draft class where there's a couple goalies that are pretty close to each other but no standout, he's someone to keep an eye on. He's also one of the few goalies with size in this draft too. There's a lot of really short goalies. Um, yeah, sure. Which Ryan, I know you're not a huge fan of. Uh, our next question comes from Kipper Flames thirty four. Who will be better, Macklin Celebrini or Cole Eiserman? Yeah, you're making me uh, choose between my children here. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to say Max Celebrini because he's a center and, you know, he makes players around him better. He was Cole Eiserman's line mate at Shattuck St. Mary's. So, I mean, they've known each other for years already. Um, but you know what? Like, hey, we're in the hyperbole business. I think he's going to be close to Bedard. You know, like they're wow. very similar in size. Wow. He led the USHL in scoring this year. He's going straight to Boston University as basically a 17-year-old. And I wouldn't be surprised if he puts up good numbers for the Terriers next year. I think he's, you know, rightly so. We've been talking about Connor Bedard all year in the 2023 draft class. But, I mean, Celebrini is fantastic. Now, saying that, Cole Eiserman is amazing as well. Um, his goal scoring ability and the fact that he can score from anywhere. It's like, it's not like there's a Cole Eiserman office, like, like an Ovechkin, for example, he just scores from anywhere. So you can't undervalue that. Um, but like I said, it's like making me choose between my children. Uh, but because Celebrini is a center and Eiserman is a winger, I'll go Celebrini. Yeah, from an overall player perspective, I, I do agree. If Celebrini would be better, I think from a fantasy perspective, Cole like they're, they're both stupidly good offensively. But you know, Cole Eiserman didn't score seventy goals by accident this year. Like this is right. a guy that knows how to shoot. The only guy that had more goals than him this year, or in, in U.S. National Development Team history, uh, was Cole Caulfield. And we know he could score. So with Eiserman, the fact that he can score from anywhere really excites me. But you know, he's not an all-around player like. Celebrini. It's like he almost needs someone out there to kind of feed him the shots. And he's had that with James Haggins and even Will Vote, I thought looked really good with him at the U 18s. But with with the way Eiserman shoots the puck, he's gonna put up 40, 50 goals a lot. And he's totally. someone that I'm really excited about. So uh, you know, next year's draft is not gonna be as high end as this year's draft. Um, but the the high end talent's gonna be very exciting, especially, you know, Aaron Kiviaru, Ivan Demidoff, like they're gonna get some really good players at the high end, but those two will be the ones that it's a lot of fun. And it is cool that they are friends. And it was I, I asked uh Celebrini, I'm like, so like your 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 man Cole Eisenman's gonna be playing in the medal in the, the gold medal game. Are you cheering for him? He's like, Yeah, team USA all the way. It's like that seems like sacrilege for a, a hockey Canada player to say. <laughs> I like it. Uh, and Eileen Cole Eiserman as well, just in a fantasy context. If you're breaking ties between two similarly valued players, I, I'm going to go for the goal scorer, especially because so many fantasy formats also include shots nowadays. And even if you look at how long it took Connor McDavid to actually break through as the true number one fantasy asset, what did he have to do? Lead the league in goals. It was Leon Dreisaitl, typically, or Austin Matthews the last couple of years. And I was usually ranking McDavid number two in the rankings, right? But this year he finally did it, and it was because he added the goal scoring. So just based on the fact that goal scoring to me is paramount in fantasy, I lean slightly toward Eiserman. Well, Ryan, that's it for the segment today. We really appreciate you coming on. It's a nice little blast from the past. And before we let you go, we know that you're working hard on draft preview. So mm -hmm. when can we expect to find it on newsstands, my friend? I would say late May uh yeah we close in a couple of weeks and uh it's always fun to put together and I'm, I'm fiddling with the list as we speak at some point the editors will tell me to stop and uh so they can actually put it together but uh yeah you can get a lot of bedard you can get a lot of fantilly you get a lot of all the wonderful 2023 prospects and uh 
yeah, my favorite project of the year. Awesome. Well, as always, I'm sure we'll have them in our hands when the draft begins in Nashville this June. Should be exciting. Thanks, Ryan, for coming on, buddy. Thanks for having me. All right, Ryan was awesome. Uh, you know, some interesting stuff, interesting takes there on Celebrini and Bedard. That's an interesting uh, comparison there. But let's, I guess we should wrap it up because we already did the viewer question. So let's wrap it up here with the starting lineup. And I am not a Star Wars fan. I find their movie series to be extremely boring and, uh, you know, cool, cool special effects for the time. Doesn't really hold up anymore. But I want you to rank your favorite Star Wars movie, considering it is May the 4th. Yes, may the fourth be with. We put it. I can't even say it. May the. It's a tongue twister. May the fourth be with you. Yeah, it's awkward. It is yeah. a tongue twister, isn't it? Yeah, but it is that special day of the year. It's like Christmas for Star Wars fans. I'm not a diehard, but I'm a pop culture and movie obsessed person. I definitely skew much stronger towards Star Wars than Star Trek, uh, especially during COVID times. Disney Plus, rewatching all all the content, the shows, everything. So, in honor of it, I will rank the Star Wars movies. I'll start at the bottom. The Rise of Skywalker, Episode 9, an absolute abomination from J.J. Abrams trying to correct what was an interesting and subversive Star Wars movie, The Last Jedi, and it upset some of the traditional fans, and it was just gross pandering, terrible story, bringing back Emperor Palpatine in the opening crawl, just an embarrassment of a movie, absolutely terrible. Next up on the list, Attack of the Clones. That's George Lucas really trying to lean into what at the time was his new toy, CGI. The CGI is really bad in it. Everything is so fake and synthetic. The acting in it's terrible. Hayden Christensen in that movie in particular is pretty unlikable as Anakin, very petulant. Just not a very fun watch. Next up, Solo. Solo is a movie that I think people are unfairly hard on. I think it's a perfectly fine movie. It's a reasonably entertaining adventure it's forgettable it's the kind of movie you only see once and i think the problem is and i'll put it this way i can't even remember the name of the actor who plays han solo he just doesn't quite have that that charisma despite a strong cast around him so i think that's i don't want to say it sunk the movie but it made it a little bit forgettable next up we have return of the jedi which i think is the most overrated star wars movie you might be surprised to hear that i have it this low but i think it really just kind of tries to redo the first story and it, it it's another Death Star. You're only three movies into the franchise. You have to go back and do a Death Star again already. You're already scraping the bottom of the barrel in the third movie, George Lucas. Come on. And I think it was just a, maybe too strong of a, of a focus on selling toys with the Ewoks, maybe a little too cute and cuddly. Next up, The Phantom Menace, which I actually think is the most underrated Star Wars movie. People are a little bit too hard on it. They don't like Jake Lloyd's performance as Anakin. I think he's fine. I think Darth Maul is a really cool character, and I think it lays a lot of pipe uh, plot wise for the entire Star Wars franchise. I think it's just doesn't, it gets a little bit of a bad rap. Now we're starting to get to the movies that are legitimately entertaining. Next up, we have episode three, Revenge of the Sith. Again, it is part of the prequels and a lot of it looks pretty fake, but it's pretty fun, pulpy. It's a fun soap opera seeing Anakin turn bad, break bad, turn into Darth Vader. And Ian McDermott as Emperor Palpatine is having an absolute blast chewing the scenery in this movie. He's the best part about it. He just has so much fun out there. Leaves it all on the field. Next up, we have The Force Awakens, which is a genuinely good movie. It's entertaining. It loses some points for being Star Wars karaoke. It's just sort of preying on nostalgia. I'm sure a lot of people remember the trailer with Harrison Ford saying, Chewie, we're home. And that's what it is. It's sort of just playing the hits. It does a really good job. It's well put together. Special effects are great. Performances are great. Some exciting new characters. This is the one movie where they actually give Finn something exciting to do, and he's a three-dimensional character. That sort of goes by the wayside. Next up is Rogue One, which is the Star Wars war movie. Very well put together. Maybe a little bit too self-serious, but I still think a really entertaining movie start to finish. Love Donnie Yen's performance, and he sort of recreates that performance as the blind warrior in John Wick 4. Uh, and of course the ending seeing Darth Vader in his prime cutting through people. So exciting. It's very memorable, probably most memorable part of that movie. Now we're into the top three. Number three, we have the last Jedi, which is the most polarizing star Wars movie. I think it's great. I think that Ryan Johnson was challenging the very idea of what it means to be a hero and why not? If we're still telling these stories, let's try and push the idea forward and tell something new. I love the way he sort of made the audience question whether Luke Skywalker is really the hero he's supposed to be. Loved it. I think it was just the most different and interesting Star Wars movie. Number two, A New Hope, the one that started it all. You have to have that, I think, in the top two. It's a pop culture landmark. You can make a case it's the most influential movie ever made. 
Maybe things like the MCU don't even exist without the blockbuster potential of a movie like Star Wars. Number one, Empire Strikes Back. It kind of combines the best of all worlds. It's the old school vintage. It's when Star Wars was still finding its footing. Everything was fresh. It's got the best story. It's got the big reveal of Darth Vader as Luke's father. It's got the exciting opening sequence in the snow. Everything about it is great. So that is the list in reversed order from worst to first Star Wars movies. I can't tell you anything. So the only thing I like from Star Wars is Lego Star Wars. That's it. The game. That's it. <laughs> My daughter plays Lego Star Wars. It's a pretty hard game. Oh, yeah. Well, see, I played on the GameCube. I don't know if, what the versions are now, but like that was good times. And then also all the Star Wars stuff at Disney when I was there. Uh, kind of nuts how long of a wait they are. Interesting. Okay. Well, maybe next time I'll rank the shows as well because the shows... They spark a lot of debate too, so we'll see about that. And that's it for this all prospect with a little bit of Star Wars episode of Puck Poolies. Thank you to Steven. Thank you to Ryan Kennedy and our sponsor, ProLine Plus. And we will be coming back. The schedule is going to start getting a bit busier again with a few different episodes, sort of off-season themes. So watch for a more regular schedule to resume soon. Yeah.